So a good friend recently reached out to me and asked for some advice on starting and building a clothing brand. Now you may ask why he asked me, someone who doesn't own a clothing brand or currently run one, but he asked me because I used to. When I was a senior in high school, I started a clothing brand called BB Gaines, which would eventually become Bizzotti. What's up everybody? I just want to make this quick video explaining why I'm changing the name of the company. And I had a great time doing it. I learned a ton about building a clothing brand, making content, building community, and entrepreneurship. But when I was entering my second semester of junior year in college, I decided to stop doing it so I could fully commit and focus on my academics, athletics, and everything else I had going on at the time. So I thought I would make this video sharing a little bit behind the inner workings of running and building a clothing brand, kind of, and share the four biggest lessons and takeaways I had from running my clothing brand, which may be useful for you if you're trying to build your own. To help give some more background and info, I reached out to my boy Bob, who is the owner of Aesthetic Imprints. He runs a screen printing, heat press, and embroidery company, and just recently opened up his first shop. But he's worked with tons of thriving brands, so I thought he may have some more valuable information to share. So in this vid, we're gonna get a tour of his shop, learn about the process of producing a piece of clothing, looking at the design, manufacturing, and screen printing side for your brand, which I think is important to see and understand if you wanna build a brand and know how your product is made. Then I'll ask Bob some questions related to his story, how he got started, what advice he has to those that are just getting started and wanting to build a brand, what things to do, what things not to do. Was, um my clothing brand when I was working with you, has that been your favorite one you've ever worked with? And at the very end, I'll share my top four lessons I learned while building my clothing brand, which could be useful for you if you're trying to build your own. So if you don't wanna watch the whole video or certain parts of the video, feel free to jump around in the chapters. You can find all the different sections and you could jump around as you please. And if you wanna hear the full convo I had with Bob, subscribe to my podcast, The Socratic Method on YouTube, where I'll be posting the video this coming Monday on there and all other audio streaming platforms. So, without further ado, let's get into it. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> Actually, huh? <laughs> it's too bright. Yeah. Yo, what's up? Can I uh, come get a tour of the shop? Hell yeah. Nice, let's get it. All right, I'm here. Yo, what's up? What's Yo, going what's on, man? What's going on, man? <laughs> Mr. Bizzotti. <laughs> yes, sir. Let's get into it, man. All right, let's do it. So welcome to the screen print shop. If you go to the screen print shop, it's the number one way for you to get your t-shirts apparel printed. It's one of the most cost efficient oh and at the most <laughs> What's going on everybody? My name is Bob and I'm the owner of Aesthetic Imprints and we're a screen printing and embroidery company based out of a mall. So first things first, let's run into this shop. Right there is basically our monitor, that's where all the admin stuff done, designs, etc. And then we got some printers right here to print our transparency films. Mm. And this right here is basically where all the garments are staged and ready for production. So when you guys order your apparel, and once we get those garments ordered, we want to count it all up to make sure that everything you ordered, all the quantities, all the sizes, is right here and intact before we even go to production. And then this right here is where all the magic happens. This is the conveyor dryer. And this is a screen print press. This is the eight color, eight station screen print press. So all the t-shirts, apparel are loaded up on here and then the screens are used right here to print your goods. Let me give you an example. So these are all screens that have already been used, but let's just give you an example. As you can see, there's already ink on here and everything, but this basically gets loaded up on here. And then it comes down and we go ahead and print the garment. And then over here, we grab our squeegee, mm -hmm. put it in right here, and then we load it up with ink, and behind you is actually where all of our inks are. All right, now that we cover the screen print side, we also do heat press. Um, that's a heat press for hats right there. We want to do 
custom patches and stuff on hats. Each pair of those is a great option as well. And then on this side, we actually do embroidery as well. So not only do we screen print, but we also embroider, which is great for hats, uh, polos, anything that you want to stitch directly on. It just gives you that premium finished look. All right, so how do you make something like this? You chose a good one, man. This one's highly detailed, high in color count, but everything when it's screen printed all starts in the dark room. So let's go check that out. Okay. You built this by the way too, right? Yeah. So what's going on in here? All right, so this is the dark room. This is where screens are made. As you can see, there's a yellow light in here. It's gotta be a safe light. So when these are freshly coated screens. As you can see, they're blank and empty. This is just an emulsion, which is light sensitive, and that's the whole reason why we need a yellow safe light in here, because in order to expose these screens, you need to expose it to light. So whenever light hits this emulsion itself, it hardens it, so it doesn't wash off, but whatever the light doesn't hit it, it just washes off. So that's exactly why each and every design is printed on a transparency film right here. So for this specific design that you chose out right there, it's an eight color design. So each and every color is separated in its own layer. So this is the gray part of the design. This is the brown part of the design, like the faces. This is the red, which is the body. And all of this is done separate. So each screen is its own color. So when it comes to making these screens, you basically get this on here. This right here is basically a light box that blasts the screen with light. Now let me close this before my screens get closed. <laughs> That's what uh, blasts the screen with light. So whenever the light hits that, and as you can see, this is black. Even though this is the body of this design and it needs to be red, mm -hmm. every transparency film has to be printed in black because you want the light you want this to block the light and remember when i told you that whatever light hits this design i mean this screen it hardens it so this is blocking that light from hitting this design so whatever this area is it's weak and unexposed mm -hmm. so when you go to the washout booth and spray it with water this part of the design just washes out and that's what creates the stencil that makes this screen and, al and allows ink to go through all right, so after that, what's the next step? All right, so after that, it, before the screens are even made, we gotta finalize on the shirt quality that you wanna choose. In this case, we went with Comfort Colors, which is a great quality t-shirt, and it's one of the standard, it's a garment dye t-shirt. So once we choose that, we get the artwork separated, go ahead and make the screen. And then once those shirts are in, like I said, we count it all in, make sure it's all here before we even get into production because we want to make sure the client's shirts are all here. Mm -hmm. And when they get it, we want to make sure they get it all. Now the next step is actually we got to mix the custom Pantone colors. When it's a multicolor design like that, we need specific colors for that design. So for designs like that, we actually have to choose from this wide range of colors, which are Pantone colors, PMS colors in short. Mm -hmm. So in Photoshop Illustrator, you get the PMS colors for each part of that design, and then you custom mix it right here. So in our case, we have a custom Pantone mixing system. So once we plug it into the system, like this red, it tells us exactly the breakdown that we need to mix it. So it'll tell us, put red, put 80%, 401 grams of red, put yellow, this many grams, and so on, etc. Mm -hmm. that makes these colors come to life in exactly what shade you want. So we can really literally make whatever color you want. So that's what we call custom Pantone colors. And then once we make that, we go ahead and take it to the press. Nice. Okay, then this is the press, this wild contraption. So how does, how does this all work? Do you have one color on each of these or how does it go down? So this design, as you see, there's these registration marks. Those aren't printed on the shirt, of course, because it's just a design, but those registration marks are there for us to put this right here, center it out. And then remember how I said, this is an eight color design. So this is an eight color station press. So all eight screens would go right here. Now, of course, you can't just throw the screens on and then start printing because you gotta make sure it's registered to the area because if the red is too far that way, and then the brown is too far this way, it's not gonna look right. You wanna yep. make sure it all lands in the same spot. 
and that's exactly what these registration marks are for. So once you get all eight screens on here, you wanna go ahead and drop it down and register it to these registration marks. And once that's registered, you take the registration marks off and do some test prints to make sure everything's going good, everything is registered, and then get into full production. So then, for all these shirts, you have a ton of samples almost that have these registration marks. Yep. So what do you do with those shirts? Do you have like, do you have them on a display or something? No, they just come in this scrap box and we just do samples, test prints. Oh, uh, okay. Print. So when people visit, they can see those and kind of look, see, feel the materials, see how it looks on right, a shirt. Exactly, so they can, but oh, damn, you can that's, see, it's, it's Yeah, just, that one is, you do a oh my God. testing, because uh, it, it's not gonna land in the same spot every yeah. time. I, see I did see in the YouTube video, this one was giving you issues. You just gotta make sure, do a bunch of testing, make sure it's all landing in the same spot. And mm -hmm. then, once you know it's in the same spot, that's when you could go ahead and cover the registration marks and then get into production. Cause you don't want to mess up the client's shirts. You want to mess yeah. up the scrap shirts first. So then what's, what's this? What is this, this contraption? This right here is basically an oven. We cook pizza in this. We cook t-shirts in this. So once mm -hmm. the t-shirts are printed right here, um, let me grab this. So okay. let's say I just printed this t-shirt. T-shirts all go on here like this. Bring the screen down, print it, blah, blah, blah. Then it's done. So once it's done, obviously the ink is wet. You don't want to grab it. You don't want to touch it. You can't really wear the shirt. Just yeah. because the print is done doesn't mean the job is done. So once this is done, we go ahead and throw it in here. This is like a conveyor dryer. It's just going to roll it out. And it's going to be about 350 degrees to bake that ink Ooh. and make sure it's on the shirt. So mm. it cooks it and cures it onto the shirt. So when you go ahead and wash it, it's not going to crack. It's not going to peel. It's not going to fade away. And that's a, that's a very important step. So we make sure we do that. What's the process for heat pressing a shirt or just a piece of clothing? So heat pressing a shirt is basically what the name is. Heat pressing the shirt. So like when this is vinyl right here, the no run, no glory. Mm -hmm. And then this is basically vinyl. Like, you know, when you go to wrap your car, you use vinyl, except in t-shirts and stuff, there's special vinyl, which is HTV. It's called heat transfer vinyl. So this vinyl right here, put the shirt right here and this thing's uh, heated up at about 320 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then you just lay this on there, press it on for 15 seconds and then you just peel this off and it's gonna be that heat press t-shirt. This is just good for like low runs and like custom names and stuff like that. So that's mainly what this is for, but really we specialize in screen print mainly done in bulk. This is for like smaller runs or more specific things that you want to get into. Okay, and I'm, right now I'm wearing, I believe an embroidered like polo. So embroidery goes right into our embroidery section right here, which is all stitched onto the garment, like your polo shirt is. Mm -hmm. So then it comes into like how many colors you want. All of our colors are right here. And then if you need more colors, we got them all right there. So. How I started in screen printing was back in high school. Um, senior year it was really when I got into it. I was really trying to start a clothing brand and then that's what really entailed me to like get into like the YouTube university and get on there and like watch a bunch of videos about the process. First thing I looked into was heat press. I saw that, but it didn't really catch my attention. It caught my attention, but it was like, heat press is more like a hot sticker. Yeah. And then I came across screen print and it just looked like an ancient form of art, but really it's like really top tier up in the apparel printing game because like it's the number one method to print, first of all, and it's the fastest method to get um, printed goods out, especially in bulk. But back to how I started was, I wanted to start a clothing brand, I got into it, um, looked at this, I bought some cheap screen printing equipment off eBay, really nothing like this, but you know, you got to start somewhere, so I started with that and then I started to make like some club shirts for like Clarksburg High School, uh, the high school I went to. And really from there, I was like, wait, oh shit, I'm making money by making printing t shirts for somebody. And it's like, I'm enjoying the process of doing it. Obviously, the shirts weren't anything special, but <laughs> you gotta start somewhere. So I just, I just kept grinding at that. It's been about six years now, I've been grinding away at it. Um, Slowly but surely, all the equipment, all the sales that I got, I just saved that money. And then when it started, like, business started to pick up a little bit, I was like, hmm, let me go get, like, a new screen print press. So then I got a new screen print press, invested all that money into that. 
and then just slowly started to do the same thing. You know, you just save money and then start investing again. And now, recently, two, three months ago, I just moved into the shop here. So before that, it was all out of the basement. It was just a grind. So you've worked with a ton of different brands now. What would be your advice to those brands or to those people who want to start a brand and maybe don't have a ton of money or capital to put up in the beginning to get it going? First off, if you want to be a clothing brand, don't focus on production and trying to do your things in-house because what that does is you're going to spend so much time, first of all, trying to learn the production side of things. Versus building a clothing brand, you really want to focus on sales and marketing and getting content because that's going to take a lot of your time in general. So with that, you really want to focus on getting sales, getting all of that versus if you're doing production in-house, you're going to have to worry about getting it produced right and then having to come back and do the sales. So it's going to eat up all of, a lot of your time. So if you don't have a ton of money, like I said, start off with something simple. One color, one, color, one location and get like a minimum of 24 shirts. Um, I would say at least get 24 shirts just because you got family that you're gonna give it to, you got friends that you're gonna give it to. So if you get one or two, it's like you're gonna wear it, but then somebody asks for it, you won't even have it for them. So like get 24, give that out, see what's happening. You don't even have to give it out. You can sell it, somebody's gonna support you, your friends, your family, those are obviously gonna be the first people. And then see what happens, see what people think, take, take photography shots of that, and then try to get it out there and make content. Content is the number one thing to produce more sales for your brand. Yeah. What would you say is the common theme you see from brand to brand? The successful ones, the ones that you see do very well, keep coming back for orders. What's the common theme you see among all of them? Content, I mean, right now, if you're not making content, I don't know what you're doing, because how is anybody gonna see you unless you are unless you have a retail storefront and all, but even if you have that, you gotta be making content, because nobody knows your business or your clothing brand is even alive if you're not making content. So, especially in today's day and age, we got TikTok, we got yeah. Instagram, Reels, um, those are all organic ways to like really blow up, especially with TikTok, TikTok really, Put this narrative out there where everything is so organic that even if it's your brand new account zero followers zero posts you make a post you could get a million views on that post yeah I'm not saying you will but making that content and getting your stuff out there is really the best way to get out there mm -hmm. and so on the on the other side of that what has been the common theme or some of the biggest mistakes you've seen brands make when we had the podcast i know we talked about this a little bit um, I remember two things you did say were not getting pictures of the actual yeah. products on people that's, that's and then just staying consistent were the two big ones I heard. That's a huge one. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that rolls back right into the question we had before, which is making content. Now, if you're not making content, nobody knows about your product. So biggest mistake is not making content and not staying consistent with the content or even getting the product out there. So like when you do a drop and like get these clothing, you wanna go ahead and make, get like a photo shoot done with actual people wearing the garment so people can see it, how it looks on people and then really engage with that and want it and see how it looks and fits. For a first drop, what do you think is a better way of doing it? And this obviously depends from brand to brand, but do you think most brands would do better if they focus on a smaller drop for their first collection, like a one to four pieces, or do you think going for like a maybe a six to 10 pieces is better? Or does it just really depend on the brand and the person? It depends on the brand and the person, but obviously at least start with 12 to 24 pieces just so you can get your- Oh my bad, I meant like, um, like separate designs. Oh, separate designs. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's where everybody messes up. Because if you want to be a clothing brand and you're just starting out, first of all, nobody even knows about you. And if you're if you have like ten designs, that's just too much. Because like if you have ten designs, you're gonna want to get 12, 24 pieces minimum yeah. at least. So that's like you're up in the hundreds. That's a lot of inventory garments. for a first drop. So when you're first starting out, you don't even know if it's gonna work. So make one design, make it make sense, and 
get that design out there, get it produced, get those garments in, and then see how that even works out, see what the people think, see how the audience reacts, and see if it sells. And then maybe if like that's doing good, you come back and do a redrop of that design or make a new design and jump into it. But like, if you're starting out and you're jumping right into like 10 different designs, you're setting yourself up for failure. Just start small, just take it step by step. Obviously it'll be a little difficult because obviously you're a little biased because you have your own business. Mm -hmm. But what advice would you give to clothing brands finding a printing company or screen printing company or what would you call it, like a manufacturing? Screen printing. Screen printing company. What advice would you give them to finding one that's good to work with? Oh yeah, of course. I could go all in on this. First of all, you want to find a company that you're gonna have a good relationship with and going local is honestly the best route. Speaking with you, Bizzotti, um, the clothing brand you had, you were able to call me up and like talk about things. And, uh, yeah. when, when your goods were being delivered, it was me personally delivering it to yeah. you. So any questions or concerns there were, I would be able to help you out in that. Or being local, um, whether you pulled up to me or I pulled up to you and brought blanks to you for you to yeah. feel them out rather right? exactly. than looking at them on picture and seeing it like that. So I would just search up local print shops near me. Whether I would search up local screen print shops near me and then contact them and make sure it's someone that doesn't sound like a dickhead over the phone. You want to have, you want to have like a good bond with them. And if that's not the case, then call someone up that you do like. Like there's internet out there, there's YouTube out there, there's YouTube out there, there's Instagram out there, there's a bunch of print shops up there. Um, and just find someone local because you could go overseas, which a lot of people try to do, especially when they're first starting out. But you don't know what happens overseas. Um, you don't know what garments you're getting. The sizing is totally different overseas. You might order a yeah. small, and you might get an extra, extra small. It's just all different overseas. So I would try to stick local, US based. And then once you get like your brand and everything out there, then you can start dabbling into overseas. Yeah. So how can people find you if they want to work with you? Um, and yeah, just a little bit about that. Yeah, there's a bunch of ways to find me. I'm actually on a lot of social media platforms, Instagram, at Aesthetic Imprints. There I post a lot of finished goods, like customers that I work with. I make like a cool little video of me printing the goods on there. And then YouTube actually, which would be a great uh, route for you guys because I post content on there. Of the behind the scenes of printing an order, literally from start to finish, taking along with me each and every step from making the screens, designing, and then coming here and printing it. And then literally keeping it raw from like the good and the bad that happens. So yeah, that's Bob Productions on YouTube and Instagram at Aesthetic and Prince. Nice. And then one last thing to bring it all together. What would be um, your top three tips to people just starting off who want to build the next successful clothing brand, the next Nike Jim Shark? What would you say? Three tips. Three tips? Yeah. Get a design made that you truly would wear yourself. A lot of people wear make designs that they wouldn't even wear themselves. So like obviously you gotta be wrapped out in your gear. Like I am wrapping my own gear. So you gotta be wrapped out in your gear. And two is have a meaning behind your brand. What is the meaning? Why are you making this? How can somebody relate to this? How what would make somebody take their t-shirt off and put <laughs> your t-shirt on? That's like the real question. Real. Um, and then three is make content. Today's day and age, that's the best way to get out there. TikTok, Instagram, really, there's a lot of organic reach that you can do. Make your first, your first post might go viral. Just show people the process, keep it real, and keep grinding. Nice. Well, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Side note, this isn't your ordinary print shop. We actually have a full retail front, and like I said, this is based out of a mall. So let's check out the retail front. No grind, no glory. As you can see, building a successful clothing brand takes a lot of hard work, passion, and determination. 
but you can do it. All you need is the desire, consistency, and willpower to make it happen. And so when I reflect on my journey building Bazzotti, these are the four biggest lessons I took away from my experience. Also, these are more lessons like seen on a more macro level, not as much day-to-day -day operations and tips and tricks. And also, I believe these lessons could be applied to other business structures, in my opinion, at least. So number one, Bob already said this, but I would reiterate it, um, stand for something. The best brands have a clear purpose and mission that customers can resonate with. Think of Nike with just do it. Think of Apple with think different. Your brand should not only offer great products, but also have a meaningful message that inspires customers to support your brand. Obviously it's not a requirement, but it is something I think could be useful in building your brand. Our customers wanna know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for? Where do we fit in this world? And what we're about isn't making boxes for people to get their jobs done, although we do that well. We do that better than almost anybody in some cases. But Apple's about something more than that. Apple, at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. That's what we believe. And we've had the opportunity to work with people like that. We've had an opportunity to work with people like you, with software developers, with customers who have done it in some big and some small ways. And we believe that in this world. People can change it for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. Number two, focus on creating the best product possible. The goal of a business should be to create a product or service which makes a positive impact on the world and benefits people's lives. Create a high quality product which you like and you are proud of. Something that you want to rock. Something that makes people feel good wearing. Be creative. Try to be different. That's again something Bob already said but it's such good advice in my opinion. And like something else he said which I loved was try and make something that when someone sees it they cannot help but want to take their shirt off and put your shirt on. So focus on creating a great product and the rest will follow. So I would say creating a great product which you love and you like to wear and having a mission which you are passionate about those go hand in hand and they help each other and it could help grow your business. Some examples I look at are uh, Bomba socks. What set them apart in my opinion was they had a great product and they also were giving back. They did this by giving back a pair of socks for every pair of socks that you bought from them. Another example is Patagonia with their commitment to environmental sustainability and environmental health. They created great product in their clothes and their outdoor gear, but a part of that product is what you're buying into. You're buying into a nice pair of socks from Bombas, but also giving back a pair of socks. You're buying Patagonia clothes, but also while you purchase those clothes, you feel like you're giving back to the planet and you are being a conscious consumer. So in my opinion, that kind of goes together with the product. And so standing for something and focusing on creating the best product possible kind of go hand in hand. And it shows you even with something as simple as socks, there's a way to have a great impact on the world. Number three, provide value through marketing. Your marketing should provide some type of value to your audience. Instead of just promoting your products, consider sharing behind the scenes stories, educational content, or motivational messages around what it is you stand for. The more you provide value, the more you'll grow your brand and build a loyal community. Number four, Bob and I were talking about this. I don't think it's in this video, but it's in the podcast. Um, niche down. I know it is tempting to try to appeal to everyone and that's one of my downfalls with Bazzotti that I wasn't willing to niche down. But if you don't, it could often lead to a lack of focus and dilute the brand's message and people just kind of get confused what exactly a brand is. So sometimes by niching down and focusing on a particular audience and consumer, you can provide better value 
It'll be easier to create content because you know what sphere you're in and you'll be able to build a stronger brand identity. And then the last one, an additional uh, tip. I think this is kind of important, but I feel not very many people think about it. And this typically comes up with clothing brands. And that is deciding whether or not you want your brand to be closely attached to your personal brand or more separated from it. Not completely, but maybe partially. A good way to understand this is to ask yourself, if my brand were to scale to a place where my products were available in stores, would someone buy it even if they didn't follow me or know I even existed? If the answer is yes, then I believe you have a product which is uh, scalable beyond you and your personal brand. And if not, most likely your brand will depend on what you do and what you're up to. And so if this is the case, people will obviously see you as the face of the brand, which is okay, but it's just important to mention that depending on what you do and your reputation during the time, may closely affect the success of your business. And this is good because if you're doing well, then probably the business is also doing well. And it may possibly be easier to jumpstart the brand, but it also comes with its obvious drawbacks. Like what if you decide to step away and take more of a back seat? Then it may be harder for the brand to grow without you serving as the face or the leader of the brand. But like I said, each one has its pros and cons. I think today with the popularity of social media and the nature of business, a lot of the time your personal activities and life kind of just become one with uh, what you're doing with the business. So it's important to know whether or not you want your business to be marketed and advertised primarily as an addition to your personal brand or something that you just do and can be scaled beyond your personal brand, even if people didn't know you or even know you existed. There really is no right answer. It just depends on your preference and what kind of brand you want to build. But I think it is useful if you could figure this out in the early stages of building your brand so that you can strategize most effectively. So in conclusion, building a successful clothing brand, in my opinion, requires focus, determination, and a clear mission. And for the four tips I gave, a lot of them you won't have the answers to just starting off. So what I would recommend is just to start. Don't um, try to overthink, set a plan, give it a shot, have some trial and error, learn along the way, and slowly, little by little, start to wean down, figure out what is your brand. What is your mission? What is it you're offering people? What is the business? I think sometimes that's a better way to do it instead of just sitting back and constantly thinking and not allowing the market or your audience to kind of give you some feedback on what they like, what's attractive to them, and figuring out how you feel from the reception the audience is giving you. So I hope my experiences and lessons will inspire you and hopefully give you a little bit of, um, of a head start going into it and a little bit of knowledge. There are tons of YouTube videos and articles and blog posts that will probably give you even more information, probably even better information than I gave you. So I highly recommend you do your research, look at other people's YouTube videos, see what they say, um, people who have even more experience than me and maybe even more experience than Bob. The one thing I would ask is don't overthink it and sit there for a year just thinking about what you wanna do or what that next step will be, just act. Like Nike says, just do it. So shout out to Bob, thank you so much for having me in the shop, giving me a tour and sharing some of your knowledge and wisdom for all of you. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please feel free to go check out Bob's pages and follow, like, subscribe, whatever it is. Um, Cause huge shout out to him. He did not have to do this and help me out with this video, but he, out of the kindness of his heart did. So I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, before we go, I'll leave you with one quote and we'll call it. So the quote goes, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. From Margaret Mead. So thank you guys so much again for watching and um, yeah, I'll see you on the next one.